Hi, I'm Nick Birmingham and welcome to part two of my video on how I made my Southview longbow. To recap, in part one I showed you how I prepared the stave, removing the bark and taking the layer of sapwood down to one growth ring. In this video you'll see me mark out the shape of my bow on the stave and I'll provide you with all the dimensions I used to do this, which were taken as an average from the Mary Rose bows. I then cut out the shape of my bow from the stave using a bandsaw and removed those last excess pieces of wood with a planer. To start, I had to find the usable centre of the stave along its length. And what I mean by usable is wood that is free from any defects. Now, if, for argument's sake, my stave had been perfectly straight and free from any knots, then I could have measured the width of the stave at both ends and then joined those points with a straight line. However, my stave wasn't straight as it had a bend at one end and there were a few knots along the edges of the stave that I wanted to miss. So to work out the best place to mark my center, I ran a length of string from one end of the stave to the other and then moved that string from side to side and at different angles until I found the best location for the center line that would avoid as many of those defects in the wood as possible. The next step was to mark out the grip and decide which way up the stave should be i.e. which end would become the upper limb and which the lower. To do this, I measured the length of the stave, which came to 82 inches, and then divided that in two to give me my centre. Deciding on which limb would become which was then a simple process of seeing which way up the stave felt most comfortable. As the grip must be in the centre of the stave, that couldn't be moved unless I shortened the stave. Luckily, it felt more comfortable one way than the other, so I didn't have to. This diagram represents the stave, with the centre between the limbs marked by the dotted line. The top limb have oriented to the left of the screen and the bottom limb to the right. From this centre line, I marked two lines, the first one inch above the centre and the second three inches below the centre. From each of these I marked a further line at a distance of four inches. Here's how that looked on the actual stave. Next, to mark out the width of the bow at the grip, I drew a line at 20 mil either side of the centre. If I clean this diagram up a bit by removing all the unnecessary lines, then you will see I was left with a nice neat box defining the grip. Here it is on the stave. Here we have the upper limb and here the lower. So as you can see from the diagram, I made the bow 40 mil wide at the grip. And there were two reasons for this. Firstly, it's a comfortable width for my hand. And secondly, it's a rough approximation of a Mary Rose bow with a suggested draw weight of about 110 to 115 pounds at 32 inches, which is what I was aiming for. Now, if you're not familiar with medieval bows, you may wonder why the grip is staggered in such a way, i.e. why have only one inch of the grip above the center line and three inches below? Well, I've heard many suggestions for this, but perhaps looking at this photo again might help. Imagine the fingers of my hand are the inches we marked on the bow. You'll see that I have my index finger above the centre line, which is the one inch, and three fingers below the line, three inches. With my index finger acting as the arrow rest, the arrow passes just above the centre of the bow, with the majority of my hand putting pressure on the bow just below the centre line. If I were to try and shoot with the arrow passing exactly where the centre line is marked, then my entire hand would, in effect, be pushing against the bottom limb alone, and that would upset the balance of the bow, 
as it would make the lower limb work harder as the limb would be shorter and therefore stiffer. So by positioning the grip in this way I can keep both the arrow and the pressure from my palm as near to the centre of the bow as possible. Not so easy to describe but I hope my explanation helps. So back to the bow build. With the grip defined it was now time to look at the limb tips and as each was marked out identically I'll just show you one. So here we have the end of the limb to the left with the centre of the stave to the right. I wanted the tips to be light and thin to get the best cast out of them as I could. So I decided to make them about half an inch thick, making a mark a quarter of an inch each side of the centre line. I then measured seven inches from the end of the limb and drew a second line, marking the width at this point to be 22 mil or 11 mil either side of the centre line. The final step was to join the two points together to give me the outline of the limb, which was the same for the upper as it was for the lower. Here's how it looked on the actual stave. With the grip and the ends of each limb marked out, it was time to join them all up to give me the final outline of my bow. When cutting out my stave, I didn't have any issues with protruding knots, partly because it was a relatively clean stave, but also because I took care to position the centre line in such a way that I would avoid any. But had I come across one, then the best way to have dealt with it was not to cut through it, as that might create a weak point on the edge of the bow, but simply to leave it proud, a custom that helps give self view bows their distinctive look and character. With the extra wood removed, you can really see the shape of the bow begin to appear. So, that's it for now. Join me in part three, when I'll mark out the side profile of the bow, and then, using draw knives, rasps, and scrapers, I'll give that bow its distinctive D shape, and begin the tillering process. Thanks for watching.